Hello friends and welcome back to my channel. It feels like it's been freaking ages since I've done like a plant care video. I think it has, it's probably been at least a couple months. And I figured it was time to do another one. So today we are going to be talking about the Shishmatic Lotus. But before we get into the care of this beautiful thing, I mean, look at this stunning plant. And this one too, back here. Um, I just want to say if you're new here and you don't know me already, hi, my name is Emma and I make houseplanty content all over the internet. So if you want to follow along with my houseplanty journey and maybe learn something along the way, stick around, watch more of my videos and subscribe to my channel. If you're not new here, thanks for coming back. I really appreciate it. I hope you love learning about this gorgeous plant as well. So yeah, let's get into it. So this and that are schismatoglottis, which is kind of a mouthful, but that's what they are. They're also known as a drop tongue plant. I'm not sure why, maybe it looks like a tongue sticking out, I, I don't know. But I'm gonna refer to them as schismatoglottis because that's what I know them as. Drop tongue just doesn't make sense to me. Right here I have the Wallichii, which is probably the more common of the two. This one, I kind of noticed it gaining in popularity lately. I've been seeing them more and more in stores. This time last year, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell you what this plant was. I had never seen it before. And so going into 2023, this was on my radar. It was a plant that I knew I really, really wanted. So I'm really glad that I was able to get my hands on one. I also have a different type, which I got more recently. This one is the Schismatoglottis Silver Borneo, which I got more recently. You can see it has a little bit of damage here, um, just from, I don't know if it's myself or somebody else. It might have been travel damage, it might have just been like getting used to my home acclimation damage, but I have this one. It's got beautiful, sort of more silvery leaves and less pronounced stripes like this one. I also have, this little guy here, which I think might be the same type, but might not. This one was also given to me as a silver boneo, but this one I got as an import from Indonesia. It was one of the ones that Claire had to receive and acclimate for me because it came while I was away in India. And I have had a bit of trouble acclimating it. It, <laughs> it basically died back to nothing and I just last ditch effort put them in semi-hydro and put them in my pond box in like 100% humidity and it has popped off again, which is amazing. And you can really see the silver on this one. I don't know if it'll grow up to look like this one or not. I feel like they look slightly different in leaf shape, but that could just be because this one's a little bit more immature. Either way, these are both the silver Borneo and I love them because like I love silver plants. Y'all know I love silver plants, but yeah, they're just slightly different. I think I care for these fairly similarly. You can see that these two I have in semi-hydro and the Wallichii I have in soil. That's the main difference I have with them. But otherwise, they're getting the exact same care. They have fairly similar needs. I just wanted to try them in different sort of substrates so I can give you a better idea about how is best to take care of them and what works best for me. I also wanna say that I have struggled with this one a little bit. It took me a while to figure out how to take care of it. There's actually not that much information online about it. Most of the places are from shops and they'll give you like very, very basic care info, not some of the detailed like blog posts that there are about a lot of other plants. So I feel like that makes it even harder to kind of figure out it took me a little while to get this one, but now that I feel like I have it, it is like growing so well and so happily that I feel like I can adequately <laughs> explain how to take care of it. I'd say it's about a medium care plant. It's not super duper easy, but it's also not super difficult. It's somewhere in the middle. I think everyone could do it. It just might take a little bit of practice to get there. Schismatic laws are a little bit tolerant light wise their ideal is obviously going to be bright indirect light that's where they're going to thrive the most if you have them in direct sun especially harsh afternoon sun 
like where it's really hot, it can scorch the leaves and we don't want that. So avoid that if at all possible. They can tolerate a little bit lower light as well. I'd say mine's in like medium low light where it lives now, which is literally right underneath the TV. It doesn't get any grow light throughout the day and it's about two and a half meters or eight feet or so away from a Southwest facing window. So it does get ambient light when it is light in the UK. It doesn't look like it's light right now, it's daytime. Um, <laughs> you can see how dark the UK is. So it's not getting tons and tons of light here, but it is seeming to be fine. But if you have it in lower light, you might notice a bit leggier of growth, meaning the stems are longer, it's less bushy, it's more trying to spread out, search for that light, or the leaves are growing smaller and less quickly. I think mine might prefer slightly more light because the new leaves that are coming in are looking like they are just a little bit smaller. So I could probably move this somewhere better or put it somewhere that has a grow light nearby. But I personally really need this one to be in this spot for the watering, which I'll talk about in a second. This one I have in like okay lighting conditions is probably not the best for it but it is tolerating it. It basically gets grow light from just before sunset through till 10 p.m. So in the autumn and winter, which we're going into now, it's going to be getting like several hours of grow light a day, which should be fine for it. So you can supplement with grow light if you don't have bright enough spaces. If you did have something like a north or eastern window, that would be really, really good because those get bright and direct light most of the day and maybe occasionally a little bit of dappled sun, that's fine. Or if it's early morning sun, that's fine. But it's those long hours of harsh afternoon, evening light where it's hot and bright that you want to avoid for your schismatic glottis. Schismatoglottis are freaking thirsty. And that is where I struggled a little bit on my journey with these. I didn't quite realize how thirsty of a plant it was. And I tend to be an underwaterer with my plants because I feel like coming back from underwatering tends to be a little bit easier than overwatering. But I was noticing that this plant faints a lot. As soon as the soil gets too dry for it, it will droop down. I've got some pictures of it. Like it will just, like a peace lily, just fully uh, down. <laughs> and once you water it, it should perk back up. But ideally you don't let it get to that fainting point too frequently because it can cause permanent damage over time. So you don't want to be letting it do that too much. And I was. And that's why I did move it to this spot right here underneath my TV. So I could literally see it every single day because when Joe and I are watching TV, I'll look at it and I can tell if it's starting to droop down. It's just more in my line of sight. My object permanence sees this as a real thing because it's like in front of me most of the time. And so I'm much better at watering it while it's here. I tend to water it when the soil's dry like 50% of the way down, which is more than I do for most of my plants. Lots of my philodendrons and monsteras and stuff, I tend to water when the soil's 75 to 100% of the way dry but 50% to keep this one nice and moist is probably the best bet. But I also do go on leaf firmness because they seriously do get a little bit more flimsy when they are thirsty. I feel like this one, I feel like it could probably use a little bit of a drink at the minute. Cause it's not like, it's not soft and drooped all the way down. It's not fainted, but it's also not as firm as I know it could be. So I'm gonna be giving this one a nice bit of water today and making sure that it is happy in my home. What I have done with the other two, since I figured out the watering trick with that one, is put them in semi-hydro, which means there's a water reservoir down here in the pot, meaning it can constantly get moisture and it gets what it wants, similar to how I treat alocasias in semi-hydro because they are quite thirsty. I figured putting this in semi-hydro where it can take up as much water as it wanted would be the best bet for it. And so far it is doing really, really well like this. I have only recently put it in here, but I think it is liking it. And of course the little one as well is obviously liking it. 
being in my little pond box where it has constant access to moisture that is really really good for it and has allowed it to like essentially come back from nothingness so highly recommend paying attention to water that's probably the most important thing when it comes to schismatic lotus is their watering schedule tends to be a little bit more frequent than monsteras and philodendrons are Schismatic lotus like it fairly warm, but really if you're comfortable in your home, they'll probably be comfortable as well. Their ideal is between 18 and 27 degrees Celsius or 65 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty average home temperatures should be fine for this one. Though you do want to make sure you keep it out of the way of like very cold drafts. If you have a drafty home, maybe don't put it by that sort of drafty window or something like that because it probably won't like that. But otherwise, they'll be perfectly happy in your home if you're comfortable in your home. They absolutely love a bit of humidity and I feel like this one is the perfect one to talk about that with. Their ideal is over 60% if possible. They'll like that the best. You can go a little bit lower, but they'd prefer to be on the high end. This one specifically is living in a sealed box with water at the bottom. And so it's pretty much 100% humidity in there at all times. And I think it's what allowed this one to come back. And you can see the roots are just so freaking happy in there. This one is a happy camper living in that 100% humidity life. But obviously that is not reasonable for something <laughs> the other two sizes. I can't have my home be 100% humidity. That'd be absolutely outrageous. I'd probably have a massive damp problem. So they're just sitting out in my average home humidity, which tends in my home to be like 60 to 80%. I do have a fairly humid home. I have a whole bunch of house plants and I live in the UK and it's just fairly humid here. And so my home naturally stays that way without any additional help. But if you are finding that your home isn't at that 60% mark and you want to raise it up, you can do things like grouping your houseplants together because that will naturally boost humidity. You can put them on something like a pebble tray. You can put them in semi-hydro because the water reservoir kind of creates humidity. Or you can get yourself a humidifier. That works just as well. But I would only really suggest that if you have multiple plants that you want to be humidifying because it is slightly more of an investment if you wanna get a good one. A good sign to tell if your humidity is too low is if you're noticing brown crispy tips on the ends of your leaves. That means that they're probably striving for more humidity. So if you can possibly boost if your plant is doing that, I highly recommend it. I personally fertilize my Strismatic Lattice and all of my plants all year round because I have created an artificial environment for them. There's heating in here over the winter. I've got grow lights. They very well could not go into dormancy at all over the winter time. And so I continue to fertilize because my plants are continuing to grow. If you haven't created that sort of really artificial environment with grow lights and heating and you do notice your plant's growth starts to slow down massively over the autumn and winter like cooler months, I would recommend slowing down or stopping fertilizing altogether because they don't need it during that time and the accumulation of fertilizers and salts in the soils can cause like root burn and leaf burn and stuff like that. So if your plant stops growing, stop fertilizing. But since my plants tend to continue to grow even a little bit over the course of the cooler months, I continue to fertilize. I personally fertilize with liquid gold leaf fertilizer, which is a great houseplant focused fertilizer. If you are using a like general all purpose fertilizer, I would probably suggest diluting to half strength because they're not meant for like the more sensitive roots of houseplants. So I definitely suggest getting a houseplant focused fertilizer if you can. When I got this plant at the beginning, when I was doing research on how to take care of it, online the main recommendation is well draining soil, but I found that the soil that it was in was too well draining for my plant and it was just going dry far too frequently. And so I recently, this past growing season, I transferred this one to Soil Ninja's Alocasia soil, 
which is much more moisture retaining. It consists of coco coir, worm castings, vermiculite, which is the main moisture retaining material, activated charcoal, and bark. And I've noticed such an improvement with this one. I've not had to water as frequently as when it was in the previous soil, which wasn't doing it any favors. So I'm very glad that I have swapped it over to that stuff and it is probably much happier now. You can also put them into semi-hydro. Obviously you've seen that. And I honestly think that's probably a better option for these ones, at least for me as a chronic underwaterer. Having it in semi-hydro really helps make sure it stays moist. And I don't need to worry about this one as much as I do the other one in soil. I don't need to be paying attention to it quite as much. So if you can put it in something like semi-hydro with a water reservoir at the bottom, I definitely suggest it. And I think it will thank you for that. You also don't need to be repotting your Schismatoglottis all that often. I would probably only repot once a year max. And only if I noticed that like the roots were starting to grow out of the bottoms of the pot or if it started to slow its growth down massively. When you are repotting though, make sure you are giving it something with drainage holes. That is the most important thing, especially with soil, because unless you're really, really good at watering just the perfect amount every single time, it will be sitting in a puddle of water and you don't want that because the roots will get too wet and it just won't like it. So ideally give it some drainage. A cool thing about Schismatoglottis is that it will grow pups. It's got a rhizome beneath the soil and from there little new babies will pop out. So the easiest way to propagate them is through division. I feel like it's illustrated best on this one. You can really see that bit there is the rhizome and then that's the little pup that's popped out and I've got another one, another little bit of new growth coming from there and so the plants from underneath the soil will come up and pop up and grow new plants. Once you notice that that is happening, you can divide those off. Just use clean scissors or a clean knife and chop it. Ideally, you wanna make sure that it's got some roots before you chop it so it can sustain itself in its new place. If it doesn't, you can reroot it. I have rerooted this one in water previously, but it's easier if you cut it off and it already has roots, you can just put it straight into substrate and you've got a whole new plant, which is great. Unfortunately, Schismatoglottis are toxic to humans and animals, so I highly recommend keeping it out of reach of pets and children. Though I have noticed that Cleo doesn't really go for this one at all, and it is in prime Cleo zone, so I am quite lucky with that. But if you do have like very curious pets and children, you do want to keep them from ingesting it because it can cause them to become poorly. So don't, don't let them ingest it if at all possible. So that is it. That is how I take care of my schismatoglottis. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and this can help you learn how to take care of yours as well and keep it happy and healthy like mine because, oh my goodness, look at the, it's just so freaking lush and big. I don't think I realize how much this one has grown since I got it, but it like seriously has. So yeah, very, very happy with this one. I'm really glad that I've been able to get a handle on it a bit better and feel like I understand it now and I hope you do too. Before I get out of here, I just want to say a big thank you to the newest member of my Good Growing fam over on Patreon, Sharon. Thank you so much for joining. I really hope you enjoy it over there. If anyone else is interested in joining my Patreon, it is three pounds or about four euros or four dollars a month. And that gets you all of the fun things like bonus content and polls and live chats and a Discord community and just overall getting to know me and the others a little bit better and it's a really good time. So it's there if you want it, but obviously no pressure at all to join. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up down below and leave a comment on other houseplants you'd like me to talk about in the future. And don't forget to subscribe for more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Keep growing. Bye.